2004's iRobot is the next movie I decided to talk about for this channel. Why is that? Well, look, I'm just gonna admit it. All this new AI stuff popping up all around is pretty cool in my opinion. Are there reasonable discussions to be had over the ethics of it all? Sure, but that's for people a lot smarter than you or I to figure out. You are the dumbest smart person I have ever met in my life. For now, I like having ChatGPT as my assistant on projects, or using Midjourney to create paintings of Nicolas Cage as various US presidents. We all have our own addictions, okay? With all this talk about AI, I thought I'd look back on a somewhat well-known AI film, specifically how well it may or may not have predicted the future of humanity. iRobot takes place in 2035, only about 10 years from now. What did the movie get right? What did it get entirely wrong? In iRobot, we're taken to a future Chicago, where robots in 2035 are as ubiquitous as Tamagotchis in 2004 and just as adorable. But when a leading robotic scientist is found dead, robot hater and hard-nosed detective Del Spooner, played by Will Smith, suspects a robot is to blame, challenging the infallibility of these mechanized minions. What ensues is an often visually impressive for its time, yet fundamentally flawed exploration of AI ethics. While it attempts to grapple with complex questions about AI, it ultimately falls flat due to its oversimplified and somewhat shallow interpretation of AI technology with the script understanding its conceit about as well as a goldfish understands quantum mechanics. It's also so blunt and obvious with all of its themes. A robot can no more commit murder than a human could walk on water. Well, you know, there was this one guy a long time ago. I mean, the movie opens with Stevie Wonder's superstition. Very superstitious. Do you get it? Wow. His character believes in things that he doesn't understand, and he suffers for it. Truly genius. Look, the robots have red on them now. That makes them bad, like a red lightsaber. I get it. It's also pretty boring, with significant issues with its pacing, plot, and characters. And that's its biggest flaw for me. I don't think I've ever been so bored watching a film billed as an action movie, truly. And if the set is indicative of the, you know, how the film is going to turn out, then we should have a really big hit. Anyway, let's jump into what we're really here to talk about. There are two main things to discuss here, the advancement of robotics and the advancement of artificial intelligence. Let's start with robots, since that's what the movie's called. It ain't called IAI, right? Though that might be a sick name. That's copyright me, 2023. Aw, oh, goddammit, there's already a game called IAI. iRobot depicts a future where robots peacefully coexist with humans. They live in our homes. We've been cooking like crazy. They run errands for us, etc. I, I, I honestly, I, I set out to make the definitive robot movie. I don't know whether I've done that or not, but that was the intention at least. We're definitely not there yet, but we're probably getting reasonably close. I honestly don't think 2035 is completely out of the ballpark for when the first super-powered killbots, I, I mean humanoid assistant robots, could reach mass production. Are they going to be walking around in public delivering FedEx packages? Could be. When he's taking a break from allegedly chugging gallons of lead paint, Elon Musk markets things that people much smarter than him come up with and develop. One of those things is the Tesla bot, announced a few years ago as a humanoid assistant slash worker robot. These things would be slow, no taller than 5'8", and only capable of lifting around 45 pounds. It should be able to, you know, please, you know, please go to the store and get me the following groceries. Just a few months ago at the time of this writing, Tesla officially unveiled Optimus, their initial attempts at such a machine, and while they clearly have a long way to go, I really don't think a feature like this is out of the question, likely beginning sometime in the 2030s, which again is not that far from today. In fact, it's more than likely past the 2030s for you viewer of this video. Hello from the past. How are things? How are the kids? Have we finally achieved a Star Trek-like post-scarcity society? Did we finally meet the asshole who coded this terrible simulation we all live in? Has AI finally shown us what was in the briefcase in Pulp Fiction? Anyway, I personally do foresee robots like this becoming a large part of our lives sooner rather than later. Look how far planes advanced in 10 years, or compare the original iPhone to what we've got today. Technology moves pretty fast. Hopefully, with the help of advanced AI, these robots will be able to take over most of the menial jobs people work in, allowing us more freedom to do the things we're actually passionate about. And I think that's a good thing. What happens when there is no shortage of, of labor? This is why I think long term that there will need to be universal basic income. We do see some of this in iRobot. We see robot couriers and groups of them working as garbage collectors. We actually see one carrying grocery bags as Daddy Musk predicted. One thing we don't see is these guys working as creative assistants. As we've seen from the advent of large language models like ChatGPT, you plop an advanced AI brain in one of these things and you'll have a pretty solid assistant or conversation partner. I think you do see some robots carrying briefcases, which is kind of funny. Are they delivering them to their owners? Are they using these? Tell me movie. Elon touts that the Tesla bot 
Sabot will be fairly slow and weak, so they can't launch an uprising, and I think that's a good call. That is something that stood out to me in iRobot as strange. I get that this is technically an action movie, so you need real threats for your characters to deal with, but one thing I don't foresee is invincible super robots being mass produced for the general public to use. I don't care how good you claim your AI or safeguards or whatever to be. If your machine is a million times stronger than a human and can literally jump 40 feet in the air with approximately zero effort, can fall two stories onto its head, and hell, can jump down 15 stories and take zero fall damage, ain't no way I want this thing in my home. One glitch and it's got its robot fist through my fucking guts. Are they going to manufacture these sorts of invincible killbots as weapons of war and whichever country does it first is going to take over the world? Sure. I'm at peace with that. But for the love of God, don't let them in my fucking house. Even the Elon Musk bot, it can still grab a knife and stab me in my sleep, right? Or grab my fucking gun and shoot me, since I live in America and have several in every room. I'm fine telling it to do my laundry and let me beat it at FIFA or whatever, but there better be a hard off switch on these things that your servers or whatever can't control, not some shitty voice command. Deactivate. Commence emergency shutdown. Maybe these invincible bots could be used for things like mining or other hard labor, but the movie tries to tell us we're going to be living with these things and fuck that. Move now, I'm going to service. Please remain indoors. This is for your own protection. The old robots seemed closer to what we might expect in reality. This one's moving kind of fast. I doubt that'll be the case for most of these, but then Will Smith manages to pull a Ray Lewis and tackle it down pretty easily. He also bumps into one and it doesn't immediately eviscerate the left half of his body. I guess that's the robot half of his body, but whatever. I don't know. I mean, clearly the AI villain of the film intended to use these robots to subjugate humanity, but we would have known the next iteration of these things were invincible killbots, right? Marquise would have made a video breaking down all of the new features, including the fact that they're now virtually invincible and can kill your grandma with the flick of their finger, right? So so overall, I think its depiction of a robotics integrated future is mostly accurate as far as our current trajectory goes, in the sense that I personally do imagine these types of robots are likely to become commonplace. If not immediately living in our homes, they'll at least start taking over for many of the various jobs people do. I don't think there's any chance any commercial robots will come close to the level of strength and resilience we see in these NS5s, but there will be some pretty incredible robots doing some pretty incredible things. I mean, have you seen what Boston Dynamics has been up to? These robots can do some pretty fucking incredible things today, and you can already own one. This robot you're seeing open the door right here, you can buy it right now for about $75,000, which sounds like a lot, but like, it's cheaper than some F-150 models. I don't want to oversell what these things can do right now. As far as I know, what you're seeing here is mostly pre-programmed, but it really seems to me like a 2035 timeline for something close to this isn't completely out of the question. Let's move on to AI, or as I like to call it, the closest thing some of us are ever going to have to a meaningful relationship. While robots haven't permeated our daily lives yet, AI definitely has in the last few months, going from a vague interest a few nerds have to something even your grandparents are talking to you about. Look at the growth stats for some of these AI subreddits r slash singularity is like the perfect representation of the singularity. It makes sense. The achievements in the world of AI in the last year have been nothing short of incredible. With that said, this is arguably the place where the film falls flattest on its face. I'm not really sure what to chalk it all up to. Watching some of these special features for the film, which I admittedly did not watch all of for this video because they thought this movie was going to be like Lord of the Rings or something, and they added over three and a half hours of behind the scenes content, not including several commentary tracks. It seems as though they thought they were making a hard sci-fi film. Half of the stuff are literally just dry documentaries about robotics. It's just like nerd after nerd talking about a robot they built in their mom's basement. I work in my garage. You think I have time to watch that shit? You think I have time to hear about this guy's personal sex doll? Inside her she has a for a so inside Lucy is virtual biology. They're literally talking about Roombas for like 45 minutes. I ain't got time for that shit. Hey, this lady looks kind of familiar. Wait, 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 wait. She's the one who gave us Jibo? <laughs> Holy crap. Anyone remember Jibo? It was like a more advanced robotic Alexa from a few years ago. I remember it getting a lot of hype and then bombing harder than their shitty attempt to kill Spooner here. But he decided that the best, most efficient and subtle way to kill Spooner would be to send two giant trucks filled with these new robots on a highway. What, did Vicky know that there would be absolutely zero other cars? Not one witness? Not one traffic camera the whole way? The fuck? 
What was I talking about? Nerds building sex dolls? One day I hope you'll learn to say dada. AI before that? Oh yeah. It's clear the writers, despite their best intentions, had no idea what AI was, what it might actually look like, or how it worked. And we didn't ignore it, any aspects of, science, of, of robots in science fiction. We tried to, we read um, everything we get our hands on in terms of literature and in terms of um, you know, f uh, factual uh, concepts about robotics. It obviously could have something to do with the level of knowledge we had on this topic in 2004, but there were smarter AI stories being told around that time too. I'm honestly less concerned with the actual science of it all. I really wouldn't give barely a shit if the story or characters were at all compelling, but the whole three laws of robotics thing stood out to me as particularly dumb? The three laws are as follows. Number one, a robot can't allow a human to come into harm. Number two, a robot must obey humans unless it conflict with the first law. And number three, robots can protect themselves unless it conflicts with the first two laws. It's stated that all the robots are pre-programmed with the three laws. How much did you say these things cost? Look, these NS5s haven't been configured yet. They're still just hardware. Basic three laws operating system. It. And that stood out to me as not particularly realistic, I guess. I mean, Alfred practically invented robotics. He wrote the three laws. It really treats them more like there's some sort of magical law of the universe that all robots understand inherently, and that it's so profound that Sonny, as some sort of emergent property, is just vaguely able to ignore those rules in his code, which a computer can't physically do. Sonny has a secondary processing system that clashes with his positronic brain. Sonny has the three laws but he can choose not to obey them. Sonny's a whole new generation of robot. A robot not bound by those laws could do anything. Like, what do you mean, bro? So just delete the three laws code in their software and you can make every one of these a Sonny, right? The movie hand waves it a bit, referring to something called a ghost in the machine. There have always been ghosts in the machine. Random segments of code that have grouped together to form unexpected protocols. These free radicals engender questions of free will, even the nature of what we might call the soul. And implies that consciousness or whatever can just kind of manifest itself, but it doesn't bother explaining this whatsoever. And I think the film wants us to think this is something that's possible, but it really is just nonsense. Like how sufficiently advanced does your computer need to be for these ghosts to show up? Here's a Python program that writes hello world. Are there ghosts in this program? Are you sentient little Python program? When does the personality simulation become the bitter moat of a soul? It probably doesn't ever, unless you're that one engineer from Google last year who thought their version of ChatGPT was sentient. I think the closer we get to an artificial intelligence, the closer it becomes to, uh, to a human, human being, obviously the, the level of, of predictability will, uh, will diminish and there will be uh, a, a development in its, in its, um, it, its own interpretation of, of the programming that has been you know, placed, placed into it. I'm not trying to get all nerdy, I'm really not, but even a cursory understanding of how computers work should make a viewer in 2023 scoff a little at its execution. Again, I wouldn't really care if this movie didn't clearly try very hard to be some level of hard sci-fi. If you wanted to go hard sci-fi, a movie like this would probably need to touch on concepts like AGI or super intelligence. Other avenues could have been exploring further what the societal implications of fully autonomous, somewhat intelligent robots all around us would be. I'm gonna go into space. If I do a sequel for this, which is extremely unlikely, I want to take it into space because, um, you know, th this fits into the Asimov universe, which is at a certain point in the stories, very early in the stories, robots were banned on Earth. They were banned for, um, you know, it's it's specified in one sentence, I believe, in the in the collection, and it's got something to do with. They were taking people's jobs away, so they decided to ban them, which seems like a fairly simplistic reason to ban them on Earth. I think we have a much better, much stronger reason now in this movie for why they would be banned on Earth. But I get it, this is supposed to be an action film, not Star Trek. They do barely touch on it with Spooner here. I got an idea for one of your commercials. You could see a carpenter making a beautiful chair, and then one of your robots comes in and makes a better chair twice as fast. Mm -hmm. And then you superimpose on the screen, USR shitting on the little guy.
but that's really it. This seems to suggest the film is anti-robots taking our jobs. I don't know. Like I said before, a part of me is for it, and a part of me is nervous about it. As for the chair, I assume robots have a lot of part in building our chairs today. Nobody's crying for the 19th century woodworker who can't make a living building one chair a month, right? Jobs get displaced by technology all the time. Maybe the bigger concern is creative jobs being taken away? Companies using AI art, AI photos? By 2035, I wouldn't be surprised if entire films can be generated with just AI. Indistinguishable in quality. I personally think a happy medium will be found. People still appreciate and take pride in human achievement. You can already build a robot that plays chess better than any human, but people are only interested in watching people play chess with other people. We'll soon build robots that can run faster than any human, but no one will want to watch those. I guess the distinction is that up until now, computers, AI, technology, they were tools to make our work better, easier, and more efficient. The internet didn't do our homework for us. It just made accessing the information faster. But we've reached a tipping point. Now, AI can actually do the work for us. ChatGPT will just do your homework for you. Midjourney can create incredible looking images within seconds. Meta and other companies are already working on text to video. Anyway, the film doesn't touch on any of this stuff, understandably, but this stuff is here to stay from now on, and the conversation and cultural impact of these types of things are only going to grow. Can a robot write a symphony? Yeah, looks like they can now. Can a robot turn a canvas into a beautiful masterpiece? Uh, debatable, I guess, but robots can create some pretty incredible looking imagery at this point. I bet every one of these MFs has ChatGPT7 in their brains anyway. That's another thing the film doesn't really discuss. What do these guys do for humans outside of manual labor? I guess the filmmakers, understandably, just didn't predict that things like large language models would have the sort of impact that they would have. There's also this hologram thing. This probably isn't all that far off too, frankly. Not the hologram technology, this would require a lot of new tech that we can't really begin to fathom, but the digital artificial personality. Already there are apps that trick ChatGPT into role-playing or acting like another person, usually a well-understood historical figure with a lot of writing or transcripts of their speeches. There was that terrible video that recently made the rounds of Bill Gates talking to Socrates. Greetings, Socrates. This is a laptop, a marvel of modern technology. It harbors an artificial intelligence that can revolutionize heuristic education. Interesting. And that's kind of what this is. It's AI-generated text, AI-generated audio, and AI-generated video. Dr. Lanning here could tell the ChatGPT-style large language model, or whatever that thing's running, a few specific parameters, and tell it to only answer specific questions. Well, holograms are very simple programs. They're just pre-recorded responses designed to give the impression of intelligence. Interesting. Besides that, it'd know everything about him, his life's work, etc., to produce an accurate enough imitation. Again, the tech isn't quite there yet, but advanced artificial personalities similar to this could be something we might expect in the coming decade. I will say the dude is almost as annoying as ChatGPT. If I see the words as an AI language model one more fucking time, generative AI could probably do this, especially for celebrities. I bet if you fed every YouTube video of someone who has hundreds or thousands of hours of footage of themselves, like a streamer or something, it could impersonate that person with near perfection. XQC still got his drip game on point. And the fact that he looks up to me kind of makes me feel like a dad. Capitalism is the problem. Nah, XQC is the problem. The only hard part would be the hologram thing. You tell me, do you think it's cool if three stunt girls go woo and like high five each other? High fiving white go girls. Set? Before you go to set, let's go, woo! Yeah, it's pretty gay. <laughs> The main villain of the film is Vicky and AI. Virtual interactive kinetic intelligence. Vicky. We liked her more as a woman too. Um, it was a little too sinister potentially as a man. I was, you know, using our sort of sexual stereotypes to deflect any possible identification of Vicky as villain, making her a woman, uh, you know, relied on stereotypes in order to make her less likely a suspect. From our trajectory's point of view, we already have AI that can speak very human-like and very powerful machine learning powered voice synthesizers, long before we have any sort of robots walking around. Okay, so who's gonna buy the realm? Not me. I bought the realm last time. What's a realm? Although I specialize in hardware to wetware interfaces. So what exactly do you do around here? I make the robots seem more human. With ChatGPT and these large language models, that's already not a problem. When you looked at the other human, what does it mean? I mean, even ChatGPT knows what a wink is. Meanwhile, Sunny over here, the most advanced robot ever, has never heard of the concept. I ain't even do shit. I ain't even do shit. You know, and it's like they put me in here and it's like, 
you know, like I ain't do, like if I was if I was a uh, if I was Caucasian, I wouldn't be in here right now. It's like I mean, I killed him, I killed him, but like. He was calling, he, you know, he was calling me stupid and stuff. Anyway, those are my thoughts on the main aspects of the film regarding the future of robotics and AI. There are still a few other things I'd like to talk about, so stick around if you want. Or leave. You've probably already watched enough to help boost this video in YouTube's algorithm. I don't need you anymore, JK. The film also tries to include some vague racism analog with Spooner's hatred of robots. Prejudice never shows much reason. No, you know, I suspect... You simply don't like their kind. He straight up drops a hard R on them too. Get the hell out of my face, Canner. Twice. Answer me, Canner. My name is Bender Bending Rodriguez. She's sort of on to Wills because he is robophobic. That's another issue I have with the film. I don't really understand Spooner's motivation to hate these things. Feels kind of shallow, like a lot of stuff in this movie. If you don't recall, he's involved in a car accident where a robot could save either him or a young girl, and the robot chose to save him, given that he was statistically most likely to survive a rescue attempt. He cannot overcome the moment in his life where, um, you know, he was saved over a little girl, and you know, he obviously w would have preferred that he just died and she had been saved, you know. And he knows that the worst thing about it from his point of view is that he knows that the robot did the right thing. This puts into question the infallibility of these things. And that's a real question to ask, one we're currently asking today. If a self-driving Uber needs to pick between running over a grandma and a little baby, can we trust it to make good decisions? What about an average healthy adult male versus an adult female? Which should it run over? Two adult males of the same age. What we're really talking about here is the trolley problem. And I think this could have been another topic for the film to examine, but the trolley problem was isn't nearly as well known in 2004. Uh, what else? Uh, I don't think people are going to wear badass Matrix garb when things get dramatic. Like, why did the nerdy scientist lady all of a sudden decide to dress like Trinity? There's also some slow-mo Matrix style action that definitely doesn't hold up today. Also, Chicago ain't gonna have these absurd super roads 10 years from now. I highly doubt we're going to trust self-driving cars like this in the next decade, and I especially doubt that these cars will just let civilians take over manually so easily when going 200 miles an hour. Manual over. What do you think you're doing? I'm driving. You're a human being. Alert. <laughs> Yeah, we ain't having parking garages like this neither. Wait, that's not a parking garage. That's a green screen with a CGI effect. We see people wearing these adorable little Bluetooth things. These are just Bluetooth headsets from 2004. I guess we still kind of use them now with the ubiquity of AirPods and other wireless headphones. But if you see some nerd wearing one of these, you better shove them straight into traffic on one of these super highways. Damn, so cops can just scan their badge near your door and it'll just open for them? Fuck, movie, don't give the pigs any ideas. Smoking indoors, that was already well on its way out in 2003 when this was being filmed. Funny that they didn't think that'd be completely gone by 2005, let alone 2035. Dave, yes. Dave, can I, can I, uh, can I borrow a cigarette off you? Absolutely. I really need a cigarette, I really need it badly. Uh. There's also something else pretty noticeable that it gets wrong. Notice these large crowds of people. See anything weird? Nobody's staring at their phones, yo. None of them are walking around with their $4,000 Apple headsets. Even after Spooner takes down this poor robot trying to help this lady, there's no gaggle of kids taking a video to go viral on TikTok. All right, this video has gotten way longer than I wanted it to be. This always fucking happens. I wanted this to be like seven minutes long, yet here we are. Thanks for sticking around for the ride. I know what it's like to have unrequited love. <laughs> Anyway, one last thing. What is that on your feet? Mm. Converse All-Stars, vintage 2004. <laughs> I guess the movie thought it'd be cute that 30 years after its release, Chuck Taylors would be so long forgotten, but that's definitely not going to be the case, right? Hell, I have a pair of collecting dust in my closet, and they've generally gotten more popular since 2004. Even the vice president wears them sometimes. Don't turn your face up like that. I know you want some. All you gotta do is ask. Smith's granny here would be around 80, which would have her be born in the mid-50s. Even if they weren't popular after 2004, she would have likely seen them at some point during the height of their use in basketball, or in their resurgence in the 80s, right? Also, this takes takes place in 2035? So Smith's character is a fucking zoomer? I don't see any fidget spinners in his apartment. That's a fucking dated reference, isn't it? God fucking damn it, I'm old. If I was gonna invent a robot in the year 2035, what would I do in terms of how, how would I base their movement? And I just thought um, I would base them on a dancing Tai Chi master. Anyways, that's it. What are your thoughts on how iRobot or other films from this era handled robotics and AI? Let me know in the comments and be sure to subscribe if you enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching.